Welcome to Uprising, Blaise Bompain. Thank you very much, Sonali. So uh, in your book, you say that compassion is a lifestyle, not yes. a dogma. Exactly. Uh, and, and by that, um, you also draw this line towards the concept of sectarianism versus faith. Yes. Um, and when you, when you say sectarianism, are you talking about sort of internal differences within the religious community? I'm talking about what people are given as a formula for their faith. For example, a creed that they memorize and say, this is my faith. I think they have missed the boat entirely. Your faith is what you're willing to do. Mm -hmm. Your faith is what you're willing to risk. Your faith is what you're uh, willing to act on. And uh, to make it simply a formula, I think is a diversion and a cop-out. And as we look at the history of religion, the history of Inquisition, people were killed because... Uh, they didn't want to agree that Jesus was God, and they lost their life for that. And so people can be members of a religion in good standing and still be murderers and still believe that they're killing in the name of God, as in the uh, Crusades. Uh, they were on God's side, and the Jews and Islamics that they killed, these were the evil people, evil children. Well, we have the same thing today. How does that differ from the destruction of Iraq, the destruction of Afghanistan. These people don't have a right to live, and we do. Mm. That's religion, and that is uh, nationalistic religion, and it's extremely dangerous. Let's go back to the early part of your life when you decided to <clears throat> go into the church to join the seminary. First of all, what motivated you at such a young age? And, and I understand your parents were against it. Why? Well, it, as Southern Italians uh, have a great history of anti-clericalism and the support of Garibaldi and the beginning of the Italy as a nation and the end of the papal states. So my parents were, were Catholics, but the kind of Catholic that you don't see, you didn't see at that time in Ireland and in other parts of Europe. They were very uh, critical. Uh, my dad would sit and listen to a sermon, and I recall one day he handed me a piece of paper, and on the piece of paper it said, the priest has gone hopelessly insane. <laughs> and uh, that's what I grew up with. I grew up with critical thinking, and he really didn't want me to uh, become a priest. He wanted me to follow his uh, footsteps into law, and then he became a superior court. Uh, judge. But I felt a need to break with that and a need to enter into international service. And one of the only avenues for that kind of service at that time was missionary work. Mm. And so that's what I decided to do. What about your mother? Um, she also opposed this, uh, yes. but she was she was a religious person. She was, and she was a wonderful theologian. Uh, she just was fantastic because she would hear some ridiculous statement from the clergy and say, oh, take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> you know. So uh, yeah. she was skeptical. Very, very skeptical. And she thought some of the practices were ridiculous. And she heard uh, when women go into the convents that they're, they're going to be married to Jesus, you know, so she said, what are they talking about, you know, so this is ridiculous, you know, and she didn't like the idea of celibacy at all, family was everything to her, and it was very much a part of the Italian tradition, and she thought the whole concept of celibacy was stupid, and uh, I think she was right. Hmm. So, uh, describe your entry into the church um, in terms of the evolution that you went through. You said that it was an avenue for you to do international service work, but uh, you were, a st you were, and still are, a believer. This is your uh, deeply personal faith. Right, uh, but it's, it's, uh, I'd say, much more universal. Mm -hmm. I think we have to have enormous respect uh, for the uh, spiritual approaches of other cultures, and that that's where so often preachers make a great mistake when they start telling us what God will and won't do. God will do this and won't do that, and I hear a great deal of arrogance uh, from the TV, from the radio, of people who are really simply saying, I know all about God, and I'll tell you all about God. This is arrogance, and the, the best way to go at it is to acknowledge how little we know about it, and how much respect we have for science, and how if we 
feel that science gets into a religious thing by talking about the Big Bang. We say, wait a minute, let's get more scientific than that. <laughs> let's not talk about a Big Bang. Let's let's use scientific language. Uh, and so we we do have an interest in meta physics, which is going beyond physics, which the early Greeks were very interested in. What is beyond what you can see and beyond what you can hear? Uh, elements that are not visible, e even if we think about certain things like friendship, love, dedication, you know, you can't get them under a microscope. And so we get into what is called metaphysics and spirituality, which does not coexist well with my trying to say, I know all about God. I know little or nothing. As a young priest, you went to Guatemala. Yes. That was your first uh, international experience, yes. I understand. And you call, it, uh, you call it a war between rich and poor. Yes. How important was that time in Guatemala to your evolution as an activist? It was extremely important. It was in the wake of Vatican II, which was a great uh, church uh, council between 62 and 65. And when I got to Guatemala, I realized that many of the religious people had definitely sided with the revolution. And the sister that I worked with, uh, Sister Miriam Peter, told me, you know, you better decide which side you're on. Hmm. Because she said, I, I am here as a liaison with the rebel forces, and I work with them on a daily basis. I have to announce to the parents who is killed and who isn't killed. So uh, you you better understand what's going on in Guatemala. This is a life and death uh, conflict. And of course, 200,000 people were killed in the process. And you were there in 1966. Uh, yes. How easy for, was it for you to decide which side you wanted to be on? It wasn't very difficult at all because it was quite obvious that uh, the military was responsible for most of the damage the United States had taken over in 1954 and has run Guatemala ever since. Uh, we have elections every four years, but the military of Guatemala, as directed by the United States, has has the last word politically on everything, and still does. So we still have a problem there. There are many countries that are definitely military dictatorships that have elections. So you didn't just pick a side, but you were active in Guatemala. You helped yes. smuggle students yes. out. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, my assignment was to work with the students from the National University of San Carlos. I was assigned. I actually had a mandate from the cardinal mm. to, to do this work, and we began these programs in the countryside with the indigenous people and uh, had programs in literacy, uh, programs in health, and programs in uh, peasant organization. And uh, the people seeing what we were doing uh, were at first afraid that we might be part of the rebel forces. And then later we heard them calling us guerreros de paz, guerrillas of peace, because we were never armed. But we knew the rebel forces and they knew us. They had a respect for us, but we were actually separate, but in terms of the military and the politics of the country, we were not separate. Mm. So where did... Um why did you have to smuggle out students? What was well, the reason they for were that? being killed. They were being uh, marked first, their names marked, and then they were being killed. And our center was uh, machine gunned mm. and bombed. And many of them went to the rebel forces. Uh, they went from this uh, nonviolent uh, movement, social movement, to a rebel armed movement. And uh, they fought with the guerrilla army of the poor. So the leadership of Mary Knoll, to which you were priest, yeah. did not take kindly to the work that you did. Why? No. Well, at that time, there was a close relationship between the religious leadership at Mary Knoll and our various agencies in the country. because Security the, agencies? Yes. Many wow. of our agencies were very Catholic. Uh, under J. Edgar Hoover, he loved ha Catholics because they did what they were told. And that went on until the council and the Berrigans came along and others that were not as obedient. And then he went to the Mormons after that because he, he 
found them to be more obedient. But uh, our superior at the time was very close with the agencies, the central intelligence agencies and so on, and they were reporting on the negative work in their view that we were doing. And uh, so there was an agreement between the Guatemala go government and military and the church uh, to remove us from the area. So you were essentially um, pushed out of Guatemala, but your plan then was to take the stories of what you'd seen and experienced to the public directly? Yes, I was, I was given a gag order. I was given an order not to write, not to speak, not to organize, and to forget everything I saw in Latin America, and I was sent to Hawaii. So I got there one evening and understood that these rules were definite. This was definite, so I left the next morning for Washington, uh, D.C., and I had a three-and-a-half-hour meeting with the Washington Post and released everything I had on the Green Berets in Guatemala, the villages that had been napalmed, and that went out to some 400 uh, newspapers. And uh, after that, I just got an apartment. I realized I was in trouble. Mm. That's <laughs> what, what sort of a blow was it to you to have the church come down on you as somebody who went into the church with the idealism? Well, it, it was a blow, but at the same time, we had really wonderful theological training in the seminary that the con your own conscience is the last norm of morality. Mm. Uh, not, not the Pope, not anybody else. You have to live with your conscience. And so... With that in mind, it wasn't as difficult as it might have been. I realized that we had differences and that I had to proceed. And for me, it was like following my calling. It wasn't a question of giving up a calling. It was a question of continuing with mm -hmm. the calling. So you went to Cuba. Yes. And <laughs> uh, in Cuba, you had a different experience. Did you go? At that at that point, had you left the church officially? No. Or had I, they, okay, I, you were I, still part of it. I hadn't left uh, officially, but the Cubans invited me to come, and I did, and I was very touched by the quality of the Cuban children because I had seen so many children living on garbage dumps in other countries in Latin America, and the Cuban children were clean and well-educated, and that really reached me more than any ideology in Cuba, and they all also were very interested in liberation theology. They were very interested in the role of Camilo Torres in Colombia, uh, Bishop uh, uh, Domel de Camara in Brazil, and uh, in the various uh, priests in the revolution uh, that was developing in Nicaragua. So they could see a relationship between the progressive church and social change. And so we spent a lot of time uh, talking about that in Cuba. I'm speaking with Blaise Bonpain about his autobiography, Imagine No Religion, From Central America to the Middle East, The Life Story of a Leader in the Movement for Social Justice and Peace. Well, you've been the target through your work, many years of work, of uh, surveillance, yes. and uh, you've had uh, dealings with informants. In Cuba, you came across an informant who was supposedly a member of the Students for Democratic Society, SDS, Thomas Edward Mosher. Yes. Tell us about this uh, experience and what it told you about the kinds of scrutiny you were probably going to be under for the rest of your life. Well, it did. I have thousands of pages of uh, freedom of information material. Uh, Thomas Moser did say he was in the SDS, and then he went back to report to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and he reported on my uh, visit to Cuba and our intention of bringing ideas from Cuba to the United States. Then Senator Kennedy said to him, uh, Mr. Moser, uh, would you give us your arrest record? He had uh, seven convictions for violence. And he accused you of being a violent person. Yes. Yeah, he had seven convictions for violent actions. It's the kind of people that are hired not as officers but as agents to do a particular job and then report on it. And they try to make too much of you because the more... Uh, they can tell on you, uh, the, the more possible it will be for them to have certain charges for, uh, forgiven. So it's it's a very dangerous situation. And that continues today as oh, yeah. well, um, yeah. particularly after the so-called uh, war on terror, the 9-11 attacks with the informants against Muslims. Yes, yeah. yes it, it is a very terrible thing. Mm. Uh, 
So uh, then at, at what point did you sort of have your formal ties to the church severed, and what was that experience like? Well, I, I think it was, uh, I read it in the Washington Post, actually. I read that I had unilaterally separated myself. <laughs> you uh, read it in the Washington yeah, Post? Yeah, I did. I, I, yeah, I unilaterally separated myself from the Mary Knoll community. And I thought, well, I guess that's right. And I think Father Roy Bourgeois was in a very similar situation today. We've been dear friends for decades yeah. and worked together on various things. But it's the same, he has the same feeling. He feels he is following his calling. Uh, if the institution doesn't agree with it, that's that's their problem. He has to follow his calling. Mm -hmm. You came back from Cuba and found yourself in the middle of the peace movement here yes. in the United States, late 60s, early 70s. Um, and uh, y it was, of course, a tumultuous time here yes. in the United States. What role did you feel you could play at that time, given the work that you had done in Central America, coming home to find uh, us involved uh, even more deeply than uh, in, in, a, in a war in Indochina, in Vietnam? Well, I was extremely interested in what was taking place because it was a movement for peace, and I began on the faculty of Cal State uh, Los Angeles, then went to the faculty at UCLA, and as a faculty member was protesting regularly and we had a governor at the time by the name of Ronald Reagan and he named five of us to have our job future reevaluated. Mm. which <laughs> and you were on the same list as Angela Davis yes yeah. yes uh, it was Angela Davis was Mike Tiger it was uh, Flax uh, Professor Flax up at uh, uh, University of California Santa Barbara and um, uh, there may have been one of them. I think there were five. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, Angela, part of that, after that, was in hiding. And uh, the FBI came to me and said, where is she? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know where she is. Uh, so let's go back. You said you taught at Cal State LA yes. and at UCLA. Um, what was your, h how did you navigate being an instructor, teacher, and an activist at a time when student activism was pretty intense on campuses across the country. Well, I didn't last long in, in either place, mm -hmm. actually. I had so many differences with the methodologies, especially those of uh, grading. And what were you teaching, actually? I was teaching Latin American affairs. I was teaching Latin American history. I was teaching Central America. I was teaching, of course, on Cuba also. Wow. And so it was all about Latin America. And then, of course, you U.S. government as well. So uh, later on, after one peace meeting, uh, I was in the central jail here in L.A., and the captain came in. He said, my name is Captain Kozak. He said, I had uh, been the one to surveil your classes at Cal State Northridge as a student. I just wanted you to know that. And I said, well, thank you, <laughs> Captain Kozak. <laughs> so you, you took issue with uh, academic structures? Yes. I, I found it very difficult to uh, coexist with the academic, because academia is really a mirror image of the church. Hmm. Uh, we have the popes in academia. We have cardinals. Uh, we have bishops. What do you think those robes are that you wear when you graduate? <laughs> it, it, all, it all came from the church, all of the traditions of academia. So just that the hierarchies yes. was something you took issue y with? Yes. What what about uh, just simple things like the structures of your of your classrooms, having to grade students and well, test them? <coughs> I refuse to give any machine graded tests. I think they're a disaster. I oppose the testing going on today with no child left behind, which I think is anti-intellectual and destructive and takes away from learning. Uh, so I never gave any kind of a test except uh, what students could speak and write. I wanted them to write and speak, and that was difficult because my classes were huge, and it's difficult to keep up with that, so you need help uh, to do that. But I, I wanted to hear from them, and I wanted them to understand that they could disagree with everything I said and still be an A student. It's very hard to get that across mm. because every time I had asked students previously whether their agreement with their teacher had an impact on their grades in the social sciences, they all agreed and said yes. But if we disagreed with the perspective of the teacher, it might uh, show up on our grades. I wanted to get across to them that that wasn't going to happen. How did your students view you? Well, we got along beautifully. Yeah, we really did. We had a, a, a wonderful relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, 
Blaise Bonpain, I want to uh, get a little bit more personal and yes. ask you about your relationship with your wife, yes. your life partner, Teresa. Right. Um, you and Teresa are such a fixture here right. in uh, Southern California. How did you two meet? Well, it was just utterly amazing. I was teaching at Cal State LA, and she had, oddly enough, been a student there. She, After she left the convent, she had served in Southern Chile as a married old sister and left the convent, came back up to LA with a social worker, and uh, one of my dear friends said, I think I know the right woman for you. you know? <laughs> and he was so correct. Uh, uh, he had been a priest in Chile also, and he said, she's the one. So he introduced us, and it, it really was uh, true. It was, uh, can I have this dance for the rest of my life? Oh. You know, type of thing. <laughs> and and so you got married? Uh, we were married uh, January 1st, 1970, and we had about four or five priests perform the ceremony in my parents' home. It it wasn't really in a Catholic church or anything, but there were so many priests that agreed with what we were doing that they came to celebrate the, the, the wedding. Mm -hmm. And it was all about the moral revolution, uh, reflecting on Dr. King's call for a moral revolution. And so now after uh, some four, 42 years, we're seeing that moral revolution take place uh, in an incredible fashion throughout the globe. It's taking place in Los Angeles and everywhere else. So we're very happy about that, that we were what we call in Spanish granito, a little grain of sand in this incredible international awakening. Mm -hmm. And I will be asking you about that a little bit later in the interview yes. about what, what we're seeing unfolding in the United States now. Um, but staying on your relationship with Teresa, how important has it been for you to have a partner because the work that you've done as an activist um, and the work that many activists do can be very traumatizing. It can be very difficult. It is extremely exhausting physically and yeah. mentally. Absolutely. Does having a partner by your side make, you know, give you the kind of life force, if you will, that, that one really needs to sustain oneself. Absolutely, because in the clergy, as you know, we're kind of the final word. We don't get much criticism, but it is so amazing when you have the blessing of a, of a great wife uh, to have someone to tell you, you know, your last uh, talk was horrible. <laughs> Why? Why? Because you were projecting your anger at the audience. And are you mad at them? <laughs> you know, you don't do that. You explain what you're angry about, but you don't project it onto them as though they were the bad folks. So she's your most loving critic? Oh, yeah, my most severe critic. Oh, by all means. And you finally realize that this is an amazing uh, blessing. Also, she is, is a great organizer, which is such a, a rare gift, and she learned a lot of it from uh, Cesar Chavez personally. We, we lived with him. And I want to talk to you about that, actually. Um, you got involved through the Chicano Moratorium, yes. the work with Chicano and Latino communities here, yes. and that uh, led you to your work with Cesar Chavez in yeah. La Paz. Yes. Um, what was that time like in Southern California? Because we hear about the Chicano Moratorium, but you experienced it. Yes. And of course, there are still many veterans of the Chicano Moratorium today. Yes. But for you as an ex-priest, although you say there are no ex-priests, so maybe <laughs> I shouldn't call you that. Um, but but for you as somebody who's who is in, in the faith, but uh, coming to the community as an outsider, yes. coming to the Latino Chicano community, what was that time like? Well, it was really wonderful. We were there that uh, day, the day that Ruben Salazar was killed. Mm -hmm. uh, there was also a uh, police riot that day. Teresa was seven months uh, pregnant, and we were very worried about the situation because it was just a tremendous trampling of people. And uh, we were certainly not able to get out of East L.A. Uh, that evening. Uh, it, it was a very important historic moment, and uh, it was uh, following that that um, Caesar sent a messenger down to us and asked us if we would um, consider coming up to La Paz, which they were they had just opened, this new center outside of Bakersfield. Uh, and he asked us if we would start a farm worker university. Hmm. And we said, oh, we'd love to do that. Of course, as you might imagine, being under siege, uh, so every day it was a different thing, it was a different troubleshooter thing. Uh, uh, Dolores Huerta was there. It was such a 
great honor to work with her. Someone would get killed in the fields and he'd send Dolores and me out to investigate. And we found out all kinds of awful stuff which we tried to report. So we never were able to form a farm workers university. It was just one crisis after another, day after day after day. And he asked me to help to set up the Malcriado newspaper, the newspaper. Uh, but basically we did small publications rather than a regular newspaper. It was more like announcements and leaflets and so on to keep everybody advised on what was going on. In the pre-internet era. Yes, that's mm. right. But it was uh, really a privilege uh, to work with him and the movement at that time. But like everyone, like every great leader, I guess he was driven. Uh, he couldn't he couldn't uh, get his mind off of it, of course, and he tended to drive the people he worked with. So it was sometimes rather, rather difficult. And mm. It was so strange to have the the uh, uh, people come up there from the Treasury Department and to call us together and say, look, there's a $30,000 plot out to kill Caesar, and we want you people to have a police force up here. Wow. <laughs> and so, uh, well, I had never been armed in uh, Latin America during a violent revolution. Here at night, I was going around with a shotgun and a pistol as a guard at, at La Paz. So it was as so a security guard for Cesar Chavez. Yes. yes. Wow. So it, was really, it was really crazy. And uh, fortunately, uh, he was not uh, assassinated, but I think he was just worn down by so many things mm. uh, that got to him. And uh, the experience, it was, of course, unforgettable. I'm speaking with Blaise Bonpain. We're discussing his autobiography, Imagine No Religion. From Central America to the Middle East, the life story of a leader in the movement for social justice and peace. Speaking of the farm workers who you were working with, what comparisons can you make between the rhetoric uh, and the impression of immigrant workers between then and today, when it seems as though the heat is still so high, the, the caustic nature of conversation around immigration and immigrants is still so um, vicious. Yes, yeah, I think it's worse than, than ever. It's actually. worse now than yeah. back then? Oh, yeah, I think so, because of the desire to reestablish the Bracero program, which was a, a program of near slavery uh, that existed uh, in the post-World War Two and World War Two period, and uh, it is not improving. Uh, we used to talk about farm worker housing. Today, many of them just sleep anywhere, you know, wherever mm -hmm. they are, sleep on the ground. It, there, there isn't concern for housing as much uh, as there was at, at that time. I know Caesar didn't believe that undocumented workers would be militant. He was very concerned because he had seen cases where they complied. If they were told to run, they ran in the fields. If they were told to work 12 hours, they worked 12 hours. Because they were vulnerable. Right, yeah. and he felt they were very vulnerable. He didn't want them at the un in the Union at that time. But what has been proven is that the people who are coming in as immigrants can be as militant or more so than anyone. They have proven this in the fields. They have proven it in the drywall workers. They have proven it in justice for janitors. It is amazing the risks that they take in spite of the fact that they can be deported. What about your children? Yes. So you were um, married, you were an activist, and then you mentioned earlier that Teresa had been pregnant. You have two children. Yes. Uh, your first child, Blaise Martin, born in 1972. How did being a father transform your work? Uh, very much so, because we, we realized well, you have to listen to them, you know, because at first Teresa and I were uh, planning to go to different places uh, together. And when my son was maybe five, six, he said, you know, th that's not a good idea because there won't be anyone to read to us at night. <laughs> and we knew that he re realized the dangers of the situation and we said, you know, you're right. If we do any further overseas work, it'll be individually. It won't be as the two of us together, and you're absolutely right. So Because now you had children to worry about. Yeah. There had to be at least one of you. Exactly. So mm -hmm. listening to children is so important. They have so much to teach us. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Blaze, let's, let's talk about also your time then in Nicaragua. You were in Guatemala earlier, yeah. but then you were also um, very much uh, present in an 
and, and deeply involved in what was happening in Nicaragua, where there was uh, so much um, chaos, so the revolution in Nicaragua. This was in the late 70s. What led you to Nicaragua, and what was the work that you did when you were there? Well, I was very much connected with uh, Father uh, Ernesto Cardinal, who had been a Trappist uh, monk here in the States, and he came to my classes at Northridge to explain the, the revolution, and also Father Miguel Descoto was a classmate of mine, a, a colleague of mine, in Marinol, so we knew him, and uh, Miguel Descoto came to our home and said, look, I've got two, two groups of superiors now, my superiors of the religion, and I'm also representing the Sandinistas throughout the world as a as their foreign minister, and this is long before the victory. Then uh, Rosario Murillo, then Daniel Ortega's wife, asked us to please start bringing people to see the revolution, uh, and uh, we agreed to do that, and we began bringing people to see the Contra War and to understand that all these people were getting killed in, in our name. And uh, that was a real privilege for us from, say, 19, well, actually from the time of the victory, even before the victory, uh, until the 1990 uh, elections of uh, Mrs. Uh, Chamorro, which was a terribly sad moment when Nicaragua said, stop killing us and we'll let this lady be president, uh, because uh, the message from the states was the Contra War will continue if uh, Ortega stays in power. Mm -hmm. so it was either, I was there the night uh, she was elected, there were no cheers in Nicaragua. No one was saying hooray for Mrs. Chamorro. And this aspect of American foreign policy was so real to the people experiencing it yeah. in countries like Nicaragua. Uh, at that time, what was the awareness like here in the United States? You did a lot of interfacing with the media to tell yes. these stories. Yes, we did. And uh, they were not always that that uh, responsive, you know. Uh, I think we're getting a much greater response today than ever before to the Occupy movement, but at that time, uh, they were more resistant, except for places like Pacifica, where I was very happy to have some <laughs> opportunity to explain what was taking place in Central America. You have a chapter in your book about your dealings with the media, and an interview with you would not be complete without <laughs> talking about the infamous Wally George oh, incident, yeah. and I'm sorry <laughs> to have to bring it up, because oh. you probably been asked yeah. about it countless yeah. times. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> but um, the Wally George interview was um, in this very interesting interview. I think it's still on YouTube. Yes. Um, and, and you were invited to the show uh, at which you were provoked pretty severely and yeah. you just overturned a table and yeah. walked off the stage. Yes, that's right. Um, how was that met? Well, how was that viewed? Has something like that ever happened on live TV? I think it was the beginning of combat uh, TV because <laughs> uh, there was a, a war on mm -hmm. with a very dangerous country called Grenada that could have, they could have invaded us and taken over the United States. And of course, uh, they were attacked. And uh, Wally George was more or less approving of that. And the audience audience was rather young, so I turned to the audience and I said, look, please don't go to Grenada to die as the enemy in a place where you're not wanted. And he came around behind me and started shaking me from the back, you know, and uh, I uh, had a one-tenth of a second thought, you know, I, I could floor him. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, that's a dumb idea. So I saw that his desk was sitting about a few feet away, and there was nobody around it. I thought, well, I think I'll just turn the desk over, the idea of turning the tables, and uh, walked off. There were a few security guards around, and finally they walked me out to my car. But then he showed the thing. 25,000 times after that, it's, been, it's still occasionally shown on uh, TV, uh, which is in the morning after he called me and said, you know, we've got a wonderful thing going here. <laughs> We can do this all over the country. He wanted an act yeah, with you? Exactly. And I said, well, you're a charlatan, and I, I don't want to work with you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, and then later, uh, Jerry Springer and others picked up on the idea. Which, 
Yeah. Wow. So you made television history yeah. as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> um, let's let's move on to um, the work that you're still doing today. That started with the Office of the Americas. Yes. You and Teresa run this uh, incredibly important institution here in Southern California called the Office of the Americas. Um, I've always been curious about the name, uh, Blaze. Tell me why it was called. What, what what the Office of the Americas is and why you called it that. Well, we were uh, doing a great deal of work in Latin America in the 70s, and so we had a group of people sitting around our table at home, and Teresa said, look, I'm sick and tired of my house being a, a uh, office, you know. We've got to move out of here because it's no longer habitable. And so we talked about forming an office, and we were joking around that night, and somebody said, well, let's call it Office of the Americas. And I said, well, why not call it Office of the World? You know, I said, as long as we're so small, it's Let's indicate that we have big ideas. So we formed a board and became a corporation in 1983. And it was just as if... uh the world was waiting for us because immediately we were able to get into uh, endless delegations to the Americas, to uh, Central America, and then the uh, march from Panama to uh, Mexico, done with uh, the inspiration of the Norwegians, actually, who thought of the idea. And it's uh, just, it was an idea whose time had come. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I-, I was just about to ask you about that march. Have my, uh, yeah. your book turned to that page? Yeah. Uh, did you did Office of the Americas organize this march, and what was it intended on achieving? Well, the Norwegians came to my office, and uh, Norwegian physicians said, we've been planning this in Norway. We have about 30 countries involved that will start in Panama and march to Mexico, and we have decided that you will lead... <laughs> The, uh, the U.S. delegation. So I said, thank you very much. Wow. So we started on the phone calling people, and we developed about 100 uh, members from the United States that became the largest delegation in the march. And it's, it was called the International March for Peace. Yes. So peace in Latin America and Central America exactly. and, and North America. That's right. It was during the Contra War, and it did uncover a great deal of the violence that was going on down there, and it, it also helped to lead to more discussion about Iran-Contra and the uh, great crime that was committed uh, by uh, selling arms to the Ayatollah Khomeini so that the funds could be used to arm mercenaries. And I think the matter of arming mercenaries caught on to such a degree that we have these massive mercenary corporations today making a fortune on our wars. So this is really another yeah. massive disgrace. Well, the International um, March for Peace is um, very in, very much um, typical of the international solidarity work that you yes. have done. Uh, and, and I suppose the time of uh, activism here in the United States with Central America defined the concept in the U.S. of solidarity activism. Um, how important is it for you to see that kind of activism where uh, people, activists like yourself, Um, say that you're going to, even if you may not directly be affected by uh, an injustice, but somebody else is, that you will work as hard as you can to undo that injustice. Well, we're just thrilled with it because it became an international phenomenon. And in the midst of this, we saw Latin America turning away from its dictatorial past and indicting uh, former Uh, dictators and members of the military and leading to the new movement in Latin America, uh, which is so very exciting, the ALBA movement and the movement of the uh, indigenous countries like uh, Bolivia and Ecuador and, of course, Venezuela and all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. So we, we feel that this is a new component in the peace movement to be present with the people. They have the uh, veterans uh, like Brian Wilson and the veterans peace action teams working uh, together with oppressed people and uh, seeing it in in Israel with the ISM movement, the international solidarity movement is Mm -hmm. so impressive. Uh, The movement to uh, stop the destruction of homes uh, in uh, 
in Palestine. All of that is part of a solidarity movement and doctors in solidarity and architects in solidarity, technicians of all kinds in solidarity. Uh, this we feel is uh, fundamental to the peace movement. And you continue to do solidarity work after the Iraq war started. You yeah. went with a delegation to Iraq, yeah. um, you know, a country much further away from yeah. the U.S. than Latin America, but where our bombs had uh, a horrific effect. Um, it, 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 how how were you able to, you know, through your decades of work, seeing U.S. foreign policy become no less vicious? What kept you going um, in understanding that your actions may not have any effect? Well, they, they may not at first, but it's like people building a cathedral that <laughs> know that it may take 300 years uh, to, to finish, and that we realized that the great evil in the world is war, which and war is made up of murder, torture, rape, and lies. That's basically the formula for a war. It starts with a lie, continues with a lie, and it ends with lies, and in the midst of it is absolute violence and oppression. And that uh, thing that we saw in Iraq was 91 when we got there. Uh, old uh, Elder Bush had not yet bombed. It was January of 91. So but the first Gulf War. Yeah. yeah, but so from that time on, we've actually been destroying Iraq for 20 years. It went all through the Clinton administration. And uh, it, it is an unforgivable sin to destroy a nation like that. And to realize the majority of the people who live there are children. And this is something that nobody seems to quite understand. It's true in Afghanistan. It's true in most of the countries of the world. So there's the physical war, such as the one fought with guns and bombs, and then there is the economic war, which yes. people are um, fighting today, class warfare, some people call it. Chris Hedges has said the rich have been fighting a class warfare against the poor for uh, decades now, yeah. and we're seeing this uh, rising up of people around the country, not just young people, but uh, you know older folks, people who are unemployed, people who are students, um, and this whole spectrum of, of Americans coming together how historic is what you're seeing today when you view it in the context of everything else that you've been through and viewed? Well, I think this is this is it. <laughs> this really? Is, this is the revolution. Yes, it's a, uh, I, I call it Pentagon capitalism, a name I stole from Seymour Melman, mm -hmm. who wrote a book by that title, the Pentagon having access to the majority of the wealth, then the Wall Street playing with it uh, and playing with the people in the meantime time and having profit without production go on constantly until such time uh, that there's no money for anything that's necessary and all this money for things that are absolutely unnecessary, illegal, and immoral. So this is the moral revolution taking place right now. It's going on. This is the, you might say, kind of a uh, messianic moment where the poor of the earth are asserting themselves, as it says in the good book, that the rich will go away hungry. <laughs> and, and I think we may see Wall Street go away hungry, and the, f the poor will be filled with good things. These are uh, very long-standing prophecies, you know. And I, I think we have this uh, consciousness now, international consciousness, which is so overwhelming. People get it all of a sudden, uh, that to see rich people playing with derivatives and credit default swaps and uh, selling rotten mortgages and then betting that they'll fail and making money both ways. This is criminal. And we have in this situation people getting away with stealing hundreds of millions of dollars and you can go to jail for life for stealing a pizza in California. Talk Under the about three strikes class well. warfare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, class warfare indeed. Um, I, I want to just ask you one more question about um, viewing our current moment from the lens of your life, just because you've, you've just been doing this for so long and you've not only witnessed um, so many actions that you yourself have taken part in, but you've witnessed the evolution of activism. Um, we organize in different ways today than perhaps we did 20 years ago, even if the issues remain the same, and the internet and new media and technology that we have at our fingertips today um, enables much more than, you know, what we could do um, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Yes. How important is the internet 
should it be viewed as just a tool or does it have the capacity to be a revolutionizing tool? Well, it's a tool, but it, it can be used for good or for evil. And I think it's a wonderful tool uh, when it's used to, to make people conscious. And, and that's how it's being used today. What it's helping to do is... <coughs> is to eliminate <coughs> ideology, excuse mm -hmm. me. Um, it's helping us to eliminate <coughs> political ideology of people who have this fundamentalist view that their ideology politically is how things are going to change. Now, anyone observing the Occupy movement knows that they're not paying much attention to ideologues. And this is a time when people agree on certain fundamental issues relating to the commons, the common good, uh, the distributive justice which is required uh, for a um, commonwealth. And uh, this is a great and exciting moment. Rather than simply picking out a 19th century ideology and saying things are going to change that way. Well, they're going to change the way they change. <laughs> and uh, I think that we've seen that as we go to Occupy LA and the other areas of say, one sign said, we're neither left nor right, we're humane. I saw that sign, yeah. yes. I um. thought that was very touching, <laughs> yeah. Because that's where it is. is that you can have Paul Pot uh, socialism, or you can have Norwegian capitalism, you know. So the important part is the humanity. Uh, mm -hmm. Are we concerned about the human issue, the needs? And using the word uh, production based on need implies socialism. Having the people choose it implies democratic socialism. So we look for people who are an example of that, like Bernie Sanders and others, the great Michael Harrington, who wrote on poverty some decades ago, had a great understanding of the United States and how we could develop an economy based on the needs of the people, which is the only way to base an economy. And so democratic socialism is where you think is, lies the best hope for uh, a just economy? Uh, I, I think so. I think the basic principles of capitalism have failed, absolutely. You can regulate it to such a point that it can be called socialistic. That's fine. Let the Republicans use that term if they want. But uh, the regulation has to be based on People have a need for health care. Therefore, health care is a right. Take the international, excuse me, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's such a great document because it just simply lays it out there. Mm. Health care is a right. Education is a right. Uh, torture is evil. You just don't do these things, period. So. Finally, Blaise Van Payne, um, I, I could talk to you for hours, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, while it's so important for... Um, uh, for the rest of us to have um, access to your story, why did you write this book? Why was it important for you to put your story down on paper? Well, several people had asked me about it, and in recent years, the publishers have been disappointed with my dalliance of not finishing it. They basically <laughs> told me their fish are cut bait, you know, uh, end it. So... <laughs> <laughs> so I, I complied with their wish because I had dealt with it the same way I dealt with my doctoral dissertation, always in the back, always uh, put it off, uh, I'll do it tomorrow, Mom, you know, that type of thing. But uh, so finally uh, I had to finish it. I, I, I had so many other things that I was interested in doing that I found it very difficult. You just needed to take it off your list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we're grateful that you did. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Such um, a pleasure to be with you. Absolutely, Blaise Bonpain. Thank you so much. Real honor. Thank you so much. Thank you.